and get this uh, recreational breakout going. I just want to make sure we have the right staff on. I have got uh, Quentin with me here, and I just want to make sure at least we have uh, Don Tucker and Jimmy. Um, hey, Ryan, this is Jimmy. I'm here. Great. John's here. Great, and I see you, Tucker. So I think we're we're good for Columbia River staff. I know we've got a bunch of others, but so we'll go ahead and get started. I just want to make a reminder if you're here to, if you were intending to uh, listen in on the commercial breakout, you need to switch over to the um, link provided in the agenda or handout. Um, Cause this is, uh, we're gonna be speaking to uh, recreational uh, fisheries. So I just wanna flag that for those who might be here. Um, we've done a fair bit of muting online, so um, ground rules. So just remember if you're on the phone, when it's time to speak, when we ask for a speaking list, star six to mute and unmute. Um, and the same ground rules apply, respect everyone, stay muted, act professionally, listen, um, and may limit the amount of time someone has questions or comments as necessary or the length. Just want to flag that, but um, otherwise it should should go pretty well. It has in the past, and so um, I expect a ample amount of input. I hope so. So, with that, I guess Tucker, I just want to check in. Anything else you want to lay out before I walk through the handout? Nope, I'm good to go. Thank you, Ryan. Great, thanks. All right, and I just want to confirm the handouts displaying. Um, someone just give me a nod or thumbs up. It's displaying. Perfect. Thanks, Jimmy. All right, so uh, the way this is going to work, um, if you were at the last meeting, it's going to be just like it. We're going to walk through this handout for the main stem, and then we'll let uh, Region 5 WDFW staff provide an update uh, to the tributary. Um, information um the handout is actually the same as before and then just speak to that so um, we'll kind of uh go through that both of these reports collectively and then we'll take questions comments after that and uh, we um, have should have plenty of time um running till 1 p.m as as late as we'll um, run today's meeting so with that i'm just going to go ahead and get started um starting off with Summer Chinook, uh, we have uh, the allocations uh, given the run size. Uh, this year's run size is real similar to last year's run size, at least what's forecasted so far. And the remaining allocation for the below Bonneville Sport Recreational Fishery is 11, about 1,100 fish. That's going to change when we go through PFMC in April, but that's roughly where it's at. And for above Bonneville, it's about 200 fish. Um, so there's uh, there's enough allocation there to provide a full season for above Bonneville, but for below, um, I think we've already mentioned the last meeting, it wouldn't have a, a full season, but with a June 16th start date, that would run through June 22nd, given uh, the harvest rates and you know, mock selective fishery regu regulations there. Um, so that's where Summer Chinook is there. Um, for Sockeye, uh, I guess the, the, the We'll have it close to direct harvest, and that's due to the Lake Wenatchee stock being below the escapement goal. Um, and then we're going to spend most of our time fall Chinook. Um, we have uh, the modeling approach staff took uh, based on you know a lot of the imp uh, input we heard um, and explored at the last meeting. Um, these next set of bullet points are kind of the key parts um, to what we provided um, based off that. And so you know. Generally speaking, it's a two fish limit with a one Chinook non mark selective unless otherwise stated in the table on the next page. Um, we uh, provided uh, Chinook retention opportunities for all areas. We have uh, salmon and angling closed when Chinook retention closed for below Bonneville, except for the buoy 10 to West Puget uh, Island areas. Um, we have matching retention regulations for the Tongue Point to West Puget Island with buoy 10. And this includes the uh, and the Tongue Point to West Puget Island catches and impacts are part of uh, built within the buoy 10 fishery. 
Uh, and then season structure does attempt to align the Chinook retention seasons to uh, as much as possible in order to minimize or um, control effort shift in adjacent fishing areas. So we took that into consideration. We still expect some effort shift to occur um, as it um, inevitably will. And for buoy 10 Chinook season, uh, we have marked selective fishery regulations on the front end up until uh, up through the peak of the lower Columbia River uh, Thule abundance and then uh, to reduce the ESA impact on that on those natural natural Chinook population. And then um, switching back to non mark following that um, to allow uh, continued harvest on um, harvestable fall Chinook stocks. So that's kind of that really high level approach we brought the, brought into this. Um, we do again, kind of a broken record, intend to bring one fishery management strategy per area and update the model um, associated timeframes at April PFMC, which is what we do every year. Uh, and and we anticipate there may be a need for additional uh, lower river hatchery tule uh, conservation measures, um, and we'll take um, a few things into consideration. Obviously, input what we hear today, um, but uh, if fisheries presented today or where we land uh, may need to be adjusted. We um, will try to limit additional complex uh, regulation complexity and we will take into account effort shift. So moving on to this table, um, I will make it a little bigger. So give me one, see if I can figure it. Oh. OK, one second, I'm just going to make it a little bigger. Bear with me. Well, I guess that's where I'm going to be stuck at. So um, I hope you all can see it. It's uh, so let me just kind of walk through the layout of this table. Um, you've got basically your fishing areas. Um, for the recreational fishery in the left column, the second to left column, you know, stated Chinook retention. So that's when obviously Chinook is open to harvest. Um, then we have your coho retention periods, and then we have the steelhead retention periods following that. Uh, then daily bag limits. Um, for reference, CHF means uh, fall Chinook. I think that's the only acronym in there that I wanted to flag, um, but we've got the dates included in there. Um, then we have a column for total Chinook kept and then total Chinook release mortalities, the lower river hatchery Thule exploitation rate, and lastly, the upriver bright harvest rate. So just going to kind of walk through this, um, not all the details line by line, but the key parts. So for buoy 10, what we have in this, and this is again a collective um, you know, based on all the input we heard and received, uh, we tried to kind of hit all the check marks off the objectives from the and the tools and consideration from the previous meeting um, and what I referenced uh, on the previous page for the key considerations. And so we, staff felt like this was probably as um, was pretty, pretty, pretty close to what we could accomplish given all the nuances and, and uh, many, many ways you can uh, structure all these fisheries. Um, so this is just one one set of um, management strategies per area. So for buoy 10, we have Mark Select Chinook regulations August 1st through the 23rd, and then switches to, to non-Mark August 24th, runs through September 7th. Um, open for coho um, August through December. And I guess the key part is uh, two fish limit, one Chinook when open for Chinook, and then uh, when Chinook retention ends, uh, the uh, coho limit would increase to three. For Tongue Point to West Puget Island, uh, we did what we've uh, we we implemented the uh, same Chinook regulations here, which we did uh, uh, did back in 2019 and 2020. So it, uh, with identical Chinook regulations uh, implies mark selective August 1st through the 23rd, and then non mark August 24th through September 7th, um, and then we included uh, coho retention. Some data supports uh, higher coho to Chinook handle. Um, we looked at back at it and um, aligned the, as many of the regulations with buoy 10 as we could with this area. So same dates and times for um, bag limits. For above West Puget Island up to Warrior Rock, open seven days a week, August 1st through September 7th. 
for Coho and Chinook, and then close thereafter in, in, in this um, table. Um, and then Warrior Rock to Bonneville August 1st through September 14th, at seven days per week, non mark select as well. Um, with and then close thereafter um, in this table. And then lastly, for above Bonneville, it's August 1st through December 31st um, with a one Chinook limit, two fish total limit. So, uh, so that's what this table shows and uh, has the associated exploitation rates and upriver bright harvest rates. But I do want to kind of walk through some alternatives we actually explored and we have some details on. These are, again, it's not everything that's possible out there that we looked at, but these are the key ones we were able to pull together for today's meeting. Um, so if we looked at a buoy 10 non-mark only, you start August 1st and run through the 13th. If you wanted to run it through Labor Day, it would have um, you'd, you'd start that fishery August 20th and run it through September 5th. So that's the, the buoy 10 non-mark selective um, dates that we explored. Um, and then for Tongue Point to West Puget Island sub area, you know, we, um, you know, one consideration is, is no adjustment, align it with Tongue Point. Uh, and so if, if, Tongue, if Tongue Point to West Puget was part of that fishery and had the same regulations, Tongue Point to Warrior Rock would run non-mark selective August 1 through the 31st. So that's uh, why we um, considered a uh, running that Tongue Point to West Puget as the same buoy 10 regulations. However, if you were to close it all the way completely, um, there is a little bit of savings there on the on the Thule front uh, for exploitation rate, and that would equate to about one more day of converting uh, Mark Selective to non-Mark and buoy 10, or two days for West Puget Island up to Warrior Rock additions. Um, so that's what a complete closure would be, would be but we're, uh, trying to avoid any complete closure and trying to provide some Chinook opportunity for, ever, for all areas. For the Tongue Point to Warrior Rock, we did explore a days per week approach. We um, looked at four days, so two weekdays, two weekends. And running that uh, for the entirety of Tongue Point to Warrior Rock so, um, would run August 1st or September 4th. Um, we haven't, uh, yeah, so We'll probably come back to that later. I'm sure folks will have some questions on that one. And then we looked at, explored the Warrior Rock to Bonneville on the same four day a week schedule. And doing that um, would only run it as deep as uh, September 18th. So that that's a 29 retention day on a days per week versus being open seven days per week with 45 days. Um, all right, so moving on to Coho. Kind of, we've kind of covered this largely because of the previous table had some of the coho regulations, but just kind of to note, um, buoy 10 and tongue point to West Puget Island would be marked selective with the two fish limit through the 7th of September. And then after Chinook retention closes, would switch to three fish. All, all other areas are two fish limit and mark select down, downstream of Hood River Bridge. And any, um, as the table has it laid out, any additional coho opportunity would be based on uh, available impacts in season. So that's coho. Um, going to keep us forward on to steelhead. So this is kind of a, a matrix of regulations, and they essentially mirror last year's um, preseason plan for steelhead, given the forecasts are um, pretty much identical, very similar at least. Uh, so the, the basic approach here is when open to steelhead, it would be a one steelhead limit. And then we have a, a, a fair amount of uh, closures, uh, retention closures for steelhead through the bulk of the run. Um, for below bon for the below Dallas Dam, it's basically closed August through October. And then for above the Dalles, it's uh, closed uh, September through March. Um, to note again, when Chinook retention closes for um, what for some of the areas below Bonneville Dam, uh, upstream basically of Buoy 10 or West Puget Island, um, it would be closed to salmonid angling. So that would result in a, a complete uh, salmonid angling closure. Uh, I won't go through the rest of the list, but there are some um, tributary dip in restrictions that are identical uh, or largely identical to last year. And 
Um, there are some um, angling closures, cold water refugia closures there on the Oregon side. Um, again, largely similar to last year. So this table um, should help you understand the regulations per area for steelhead. And then lastly, um, I think this is a carryover from last meeting, but we just kept it in there. Bar again, barbless hooks are required um, uh, for jointly managed waters with Oregon and Washington. So before we jump to the Washington tributary recreational handout, I do want to check in with other um, Washington and Oregon staff if there's any additional um, comments or thoughts you wanted to share regarding to uh, um, this section of the handout. Hey Ryan, this is Jimmy. I think you did a good job of covering that, but I'll let other people comment. Thanks. Ryan, this is John. Um, I was wondering, and maybe I missed it today. I, I think you guys covered it north of Falcon one, but for new people signing on, maybe some context would help. And uh, I think last year, the three season model had uh, for recreational fisheries in the Columbia had 7.64 exploitation rate available and then postseason actual was 10.93 and this year we're somewhere around for right now seven and a quarter so basically we're we have to we only have 66% of what we used last year, which is driving driving these actions, right? So I thought that would be helpful to put it in context of, you know, why, you know, why why are you doing this? So. Yeah, thank you, John. That's a good point. Um, probably have a few new folks on the line. The um, we last year just don't want to rehash last year a whole lot want to move forward but at the same point um we had to lean on the ocean rollover to provide already a, a reduced uh fishing opportunity in river last year and relied heavily on that and that's why our postseason numbers are much higher than our preseason expectations for last year and so this year um, we're the ocean everyone is constrained on the uh, lower river hatchery tule rate um given there's you know fewer uh well those impacts have uh, accumulated in river um and working with a little bit less this year um from last year's postseason approach actually quite a bit less um and so yeah that's that's kind of why that is why you're seeing this this packet look substantially different than previous years in, in some regards, uh, and it is especially and specifically focused on shaping around the uh, LRH Thule uh, conservation objectives. Tucker, do you have anything else to add to this or, or Quentin? No, I don't. Thanks, Ryan. Ryan, maybe just a, a quick clarifier for folks, and, and sorry if you covered this earlier, but maybe, you know, I appreciate how you laid out some of the retention alternatives, uh, you know, below the the sort of the, the, the base things, but when you're looking at sort of the Chinook retention alternatives, uh, at the buoy 10 non-mark selective, we have August 20 to September 5th. Does that include after that, would that include any coho fishing after that, or is that using sort of all the Chinook um, available? Hi, Tucker. This is Quentin Doherty. Um, yeah, that those dates there reflect uh, coho retention post Chinook retention. Thanks. All right. Um, with that, I think I'll move us to the tributary handout. Then we'll come back to um, uh, hopefully is quite a few comments and thoughts. So let me uh, see if I can pull that up one second.
Hey, Ryan, can you hear me OK? Yes, I can. Yeah, so um, maybe I can I can talk to the tributary handout uh, briefly. So uh, we did not plan to, you know, walk through this in its entirety again today. Um, we, uh, you know, before the North Falcon number one meeting, we we distributed that that pretty pretty short time turn turnaround before the last meeting. So we just wanted to give people an additional time to comment. Um, at last meeting, we did receive a few, uh, you know, several comments around kind of our, our Drano Lake fishery issues and our proposals there and some questions that we asked um, in this handout about the northwest corner of the lake and some uh, potential management strategies there. And we did get some comments on that. Um, we got some comments last time around um, the CAMA SLU regulation and uh, clarifying language with our enforcement folks. Um, and I, I think we ran a little short on time to address a few of those questions at the last meeting. So um, maybe I can just touch on a couple things and then we kind of wanted to preserve most of the time today to, to just take additional comments um, on the main stem issues and any tributary issues, if, if that works for you, Ryan. That works for me, thanks. Yeah, so yeah, I think that the cam, you know, maybe starting with the Camus Lou piece here, just uh, uh, we did we did work with our enforcement folks a, ahead of last meeting to develop this language. Um, uh, we we did receive some comments that uh, maybe there could be some additional clarity there. Um, uh, our enforcement folks and working with them uh, so far, we feel like this is a, a pretty clear uh, description of the rule. And, and would still allow us quite a bit of flexibility in how we manage in season through emergency rule. So um, really it clarifies that this area would continue to be open to Oregon uh, fishers for, uh, when fishing from a floating device uh, and that the two pole endorsement would be allowed and then simply just uh, aligns the, the rest of the rules with the main stem um, in the adjacent main stem Columbia. So, um, I guess you know would entertain any additional comments on on further clarification, um, but that uh, that was one comment we did receive on that rule. Um, and then let's see uh, regarding our Wind River rule. I think we received a comment about uh, how we came up with our proposed uh, uh, time frame for for opening to uh, non mark selective in October and. And we did work backwards uh, from uh, utilized our spawning ground survey information, uh, worked with staff to look at uh, things like um, adult ab abundance counts and red uh, counts up in the Wind River itself. And when we expected that fish would be uh, moving out of the out of the bubble fishery there, uh, and that's how we did come up with that uh, that 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 we're proposing. So. Um, Outside of that, and and you know several of the comments that we got around the Drano uh, rule last meeting, um, we did not get much more so far online, I believe, around the tributary package. So I guess I would just say we're you know continue to be open to additional comments that um, folks might have, and we'll take those into consideration as well. Thanks, Bryce. All right, with that, I'm going to populate the other handout. Um, one second while I do that. So we're going to try to reserve the rest of the time for some thoughts, questions, comments. Um, I do ask, I don't want to invoke the three minute rule, but uh, just ask everyone to stay, uh, stay tuned to, you know, airtime you, you need. Um, and no reason to dive to, you know, rehash um, comments previously made, maybe just say in support or, you know, not supportive of. Um, just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, I, I will try to, once we get a speaking list going, I'll get going on that soon. I want to uh, make sure we hear from those who haven't uh, talked yet. So I may um, um, keep that in mind if folks put their hand up later on after they've already uh, spoken. So with that, um, just remember all the ground rules are already laid out um, and go ahead and raise your hand. Um, 
and I will add you to the speaking list. And I have Bob Reese already. And looking for other hands or and if you can't raise your hand, um, you can speak your name. I've got Ed Gunderson Gunderson. So I will create this list before we get started first. Hey, Ryan, can you put me down for comment, please? Robert Moxley. Robert Moxley, I have you down. Thank you. All right, I know there's more thoughts and questions and comments out there, so go for it. Raise your hand now, please. There we go. Cameron, I have you down. Thank you. Ryan, Jesse Vassar, please. All right, I have you, Jesse. Thank you. And then I have Harry Barber. Then Greg King. All right, let's, and then Randy Woosley, thank you. Liz, thank you, Liz. And Butch, I have you down. All right, we'll go ahead and get started um, and we'll see where that leaves us and then go from there. Uh, I do want to make mention we may not be able to answer all your questions or may not answer your questions, but I just want to acknowledge we we do hear your comments and recognize and, and we'll take them into consideration. So I just want to make that point. If we skip over a question you have, it's because either we're looking it up or we're trying to manage the time we have left. But we definitely hear what you have to say. Um, so Bob Reese, why don't you go ahead and get us started? OK, thanks you guys for all the work around this modeling. I know you <laughs> spent a lot of time and effort doing it. We appreciate it. Um, question regarding the alternative uh, that's bulleted below Chinook retention alternatives, the August 20th through September 5th, which actually, you know, meets the goal of uh, prosecuting a Chinook fishery through Labor Day. Question, does that compromise the mark select opportunity prior to the 20th? It, it must be the case. Otherwise, I would have, I would certainly, Northwest Guides and Anglers would certainly support that alternative, but probably not at the cost of a mark select fishery prior to the 20th. So if I could get clarification and, and issue my support for that alternative, barring that caveat. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, appreciate your your thoughts and then that specific question. Um, this may help clarify everything. Um, so, what you see, August twenty through September fifth, that would um, that does not have any form of any Chinook retention prior to August twentieth. So, it's basically in place of the August first through the I think it's the twenty third mark select and the rest non mark after that. So, it's kind of essentially impact neutral if you want to look at it from that way. Um, so that's what that means. That's non mark only closed in, on, on the front end. OK, appreciate that clarification. I'll probably um, I know you guys did your best to get these models out as soon as possible. And again, appreciate that. I I probably will vet that more with the membership to see if there's an appetite for that. But my general thought is that we would probably support what what is in the above table with the with the mark select opportunity on the front part of that fishery. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Yeah, I hate to interrupt, Ryan, but does that include coho in the early part? No coho retention either? Go ahead, Quentin. Uh, this is Quentin. Yeah, hi, Liz. Uh, no coho prior to August 20th. It'd be post um, Chinook retention. Uh, yeah, post Chinook retention for coho. All right, um, next up I have Ed Gunderson. Let's go ahead, Ed. And star six to unmute if if that's what oh, you're unmuted. You're good now. Hey, I was wondering about uh, thank you. By the way, um, it seems like there's a large emphasis on the Thule, so I'm not really sure. I mean, other than a you know, what is it a food source? For the other fish, why is that so, such a big deal? So yeah, let me try to hit that real quick. 
if I heard your question right, if not, other staff can jump in. Um, but you know, the Thule is uh, one, it's one stock of, uh, it's a, of Chinook. And specifically, we have a conservation objective for the lower Columbia River natural Thule stock. And so we are most constrained this year on impacts to that stock. Um, so we have a limited amount of fishing opportunity windows to provide um, given other years of opportunity. I, I don't okay. know if that answered your, answered your question, but I hope yeah. that helped. Well, it leads me to my point. I mean, for, okay, as a fisherman, it, it seems like that's not the fish to catch. That they're, they're stinky, they stink up your boat the whole nine yards. So last year on Facebook, I saw a post where a guy kept a tule and you guys were thinking about closing it. A guide kept a tule and uh, for a customer. And the guide came back with a defense because everybody was picking on him. Um, my customer paid 250 bucks and he wants a picture of a fish. That seems just kind of weird to me as a fisherman. Why don't, I mean, if there's, if they're not that good to eat and they smell like hell, why don't you just close it completely? Why take that gamble? Why take the chance? I mean, if you can't eat them, what are they? Fish bait or, I mean, uh, cat food or what? What's, I don't get it. So, yeah, so I won't dare to uh, assume what everyone thinks of, of two leaves versus others fish, but uh, everyone, it is a fish that uh, we do have a harvestable amount that, that feeds the uh, ocean fishery and river fishery. And right. it's the public, there are regulations that do allow harvest and some people choose to, and um, that's, um, we're providing opportunity. So uh, Tucker, anything else? And then uh, Ed, uh, we, might, we might move yeah, on I mean, now. Everybody has different opinions on, on different fish here and there. Uh, you know, they are a lower river fish so they mature earlier uh you know when they first come back right you know, they you know they do look brighter so um you know they may not be as readily determinable as tulies when you first find them in the water uh and then when you know once they're dead they do darken so you know it's it's not as easy uh as it might seem to some folks especially once they're dead that it is a tulie. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy to tell, you know, maybe later, especially when you have a tule on, but early on, you know, I've seen a lot of pictures of people who think they have uh, bright fish uh, hoisting tules up in the air. So I think folks, you know, shouldn't be so quick to judge. It's a lot harder to tell those fish apart, especially early in August, than a lot of folks want to uh, see. Plus, you know, what do you get? Tell a kid that he, uh, you know, can't keep his first salmon. I, I don't know. I think, you know, it's pretty easy to value judge here in April uh, when you never caught a salmon. And I think we ought to uh, be a little less judgmental on that part. We're trying to manage fisheries the best we can, uh, provide the best opportunities we can. Uh, and, and so, yeah, just you know, let's try to be a little less judgmental on that front. Thanks. Just trying to learn. Thanks, and uh, might move us down the list, but thanks for your thoughts and, and comment there. So, Robert Moxley, you're up next. Robert? Unmute. So, I won't take up a lot of people's time. I realize how valuable it is, and I profusely apologize for going over last time. I'll, I'll give myself 10 lashes. So anyways, as far as the, the um, some of the proposals here, I see that we're going to add Tongue Point to West Puget Island into the buoy 10 fishery impacts. With that, are we going to take some of the impacts from the adjacent fishery and give them to buoy 10 uh, to try to make it an equitable shift in regards to uh, areas fishing? So the way we approach that, I'll keep this really simple, is um, it didn't really cost the above Puget Island area 
Um, this essentially came out of the buoy 10 fishery to, to basically extend, um, if you want to look at it that way, the line for Chinook and Coho retention up to West Puget Island to be have concurrent regulations between the two areas. So um, it actually, as far as if you really want to look at it, came out of the buoy 10 pot. Yes, exactly. And so, I mean, if we're adding, you know, if we're taking out of the buoy 10 pot, why can't we take some of the impacts of some long view and give them to buoy 10? Because before that was the long view fishery impacts, was it not? Am I, am I, am I wrong about that? So I guess I can, uh, I don't want to be blunt about it, but there's no real true allocation or ownership of impacts. It's a suite for the recreational. And so we kind of look at past year's averages and harvest rates and what shapes what we have, how we have to shape fisheries to meet our objectives. So it's kind of this dynamic. It always moves around a bit. Um, but part of our approach this year was something similar to past usage, but also uh, opportunity for everyone everywhere for some you know meaningful amount. Hey Ryan, I'd just like to add that those uh, Tongue Point to West Puget impacts generally occur very close to Tongue Point and they're usually made by the Buoy 10 fleet. So that was part of the thinking there. And the other part of the thinking was that we just wanted to avoid a large closed area in the river. Um, we wanted to try and keep it all open if possible. Thanks, Jimmy. Did that help, Robert? Yeah, I mean, it is what it is. It's it's just frustrating because, I mean, we modeled, you modeled till the 23rd and we're adding fishing area of which will consume impacts. And I don't know if those are in that, that model. And so I can only assume we're, because we're adding area, and I don't know how many miles that is, um, we're going we're, we're gonna to use impacts faster, even faster than before. So anyway, I mean, for what it's worth. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we may, I'm sure we'll come back to some of this discussion, so I'll, I'll keep us rolling forward. But thank you again. Appreciate your thoughts. Uh, thank Cameron you. Black, you're up next. Yeah, you hear me, Ryan? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for doing this. Appreciate your time as always. I uh, running around out here, so I, I, I might have missed this. And I did hear a f uh, another gentleman speak to this a little bit um, in before the breakout. But there's no modeling for anything after like the September 14th fishery um, up in the Warrior Rock to Bonneville area. And just over the last few years, that fishery, well, I mean, just the whole month of October has become very, very productive. And it's also very, very productive for coho fishing. Um, it allows us to spread out uh, with the cowlets reopening this year, um, you know, or at least for some opportunity there for some hatchery Chinook. I mean, I'm looking at the month of October, uh, seeing the whole fleet for, you know, everything below Bonneville, uh, Portland, Southwest Washington, just concentrating on, you know, two tributaries without that uh, mid Columbia fishery open. And without having anything modeled past the 14th, I'd like to see something to where, cause I know to, to my understanding is we don't use a lot, if very little of the LRH impacts in that October fishery from, you know, long view up, or excuse me, from uh, West Puget Island up. And I'd like to see at least to have that open for, you know, a real sound discussion because, I mean, we leave buoy 10 open, um, you know, we, we're for, for coho, you know, down there through the year because we understand that that's a pretty viable fishery for coho. Well, the mid rivers is, you know, just with the advent of the, as you guys coin it, orbital flashers and stuff, it's really become a, a really good fishery that goes well, well to Halloween. Um, I just would love to see some, additional thought there and you know like i said just with the whole effort shift and and spreading people out and the interest in that and really what it costs us to have that october fishery uh, i'd really like to see uh, maybe some things that basically speak to that whether we have to sacrifice a couple days in the lower first you know to where we get what well, i'm like i don't know what those are i don't know if it's one day or five days or a week or you know it'd, it'd be real interesting to see and at least put it on the table for a discussion yeah, Cameron, thanks for that. That's actually a good question. I think we sort of uh, saw this one coming. So uh, we had a little bit of last night to think of chew on it. And so what we do know is the, the Lower River Hatchery Tules are largely cleared out of the main stem by mid-October. Um, so anything prior to that is going to take some Thule impacts, which means less of what you see in the table. 
Um, I think that goes without saying, but just want to let you know. Um, and yeah, so but it's something we'll we'll think about, look at. Um, don't want to make any false promises, but definitely appreciate that thought. It's it's helpful to know that and hear that there's in. And, and Ryan, real quick too, you know, there's no like I know one of the previous guys. I was kind of running, couldn't catch it, but you know, there's no buffers, you know, into some of these, um, you know, some of these fisheries below Warrior Rock, right? There's no associated like holdover impacts. So if if there is none, but we we do hold a little bit over, you know, for October at some point in time. I mean, I know I'd hate. I mean, I, I my biggest complaint is that when you guys set a season, we have to go back on it. So I'd rather see the under promise and then the over deliver. But even then, if we do set aside, you know, some actual instead of using 100 percent of our impacts through September 14th, if we have a little bit left over for October, it gives you guys a little bit of fudge room, too. So, yep. I mean, like I said, I, we just don't I just want to know what those exact days are. Like, how many days are we sacrificing to get October? OK, well, um, I might. Me, but I'll let staff kind of chew on that. I mean, we might come back to that. I don't want to guarantee anything, um, but definitely hear you on that. And yeah, everything is stretched out right now. There's no no buffering going on anywhere. Um, so, um, thank I you, move, yeah, thanks, Cameron. Want to move us down the speaking list, but I do want to provide and apologize for everyone else that's in front. But uh, I know I saw Liz is going to leave by noon. I didn't know if she had a, a quick thought or comment. Um, I do that with anyone if I can. So I'm just kind of Liz before you jump off. Um, if you have a, a thought or something, sorry, I apologize for everyone else jumping ahead. No, and I'm, I, I don't want to do that, Ryan. We we had a, a long meeting last night that I would like to share, but I the meeting is short. I'd like to get back in the queue when I come back, if that's all right with you that's and fine. everyone else. Yep. Yep. Thank Thanks. you. I appreciate sorry. that. Yeah. Sorry about that, everyone. All right. Uh, Jesse. Uh, Vassar, go ahead. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, first off, you know, as some other people have said, I'd, I appreciate all the work that staff is doing. I know you guys uh, kind of um, are finding an uphill battle and and putting together some of these models and and trying to uh, you know put equitable fisheries uh, together for everybody. Um, you know, I want to. I guess. I guess I have one question here before I I make a couple other points on the the uh, alternative seasons here. On that. Uh, uh, buoy 10 August 1st to 13th with once uh, we got to the 14th would then buoy 10 stay open for uh, for coho at that point or would it be closed until somewhere around September um, Labor Day to open back up for coho hey Jesse it's Quentin here uh, yes um, that includes coho um, post Chinook retention so starting August 14th it would continue to be open for coho retention okay okay OK, um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one, no matter how you how you try to, to slice the pie on these ones. It's it, you know, it's um, you guys really have your work cut out for you here. But, um, you know, I guess I would like to echo a little bit of the points that uh, that uh, Robert uh, Moxley made. Um, you know, it seems like uh, expanding, you know, kind of that's uh, the buoy 10 line up to Puget Island. Um, you know, you're seems like there's that uh real scenario though uh, there of eating through those impacts even even uh you know quicker than what we have in the past so i don't want to you know dwell on somebody you know a, a point that was made too much more than that and then uh same thing as cameron said i would be interested a little bit to see what the expense is um you know for this uh august and september uh, to get some some uh, some of those days there in uh, in October, because I know that's uh, you know that coho fishery um, you know upriver here has um, um, gotten figured out a little bit and and can be a um, a pretty good uh, opportunity for folks. So um, all in all, though, thank you guys. I think the models you put together here are really good, and and obviously you guys have put a significant amount of time into these. So thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Appreciate that. Um, Harry, you're up next. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. I think you, you sort of answered my question about the the uh, closure to West Puget Island and spreading of those impacts. Uh, I understand better now why you're, I guess you're spreading it back to Buoy 10, but Buoy 10 does have a lion's share of those impacts. So my thought where originally was, might make sense to try to sp spread those impacts further upstream. 
I'm curious, are you looking for comments uh, in areas other than just the, the fall Chinook? I mean, are you looking for comments now on, on Summers and Steelhead? Uh, yes to that. Okay. Uh, on, on the second part of the, uh, the spring season after the run update, uh, I assume there will be a season. Uh, Preference is to start that around June 1st or whatever in June, early June you can start it and run it consecutively into uh, the summer Chinook season, which opens on June 16th. That makes for a nice extended uh, fishery. And summer Chinook, we're looking at a, a really short uh, summer uh, Chinook season. I think it's only about six days. Uh, and it's, I think I know the answer to the question, but you certainly want to ask is, you get another day if the, uh, if the catch limit is one fish instead of two. Uh, it'd be nice to have more days in that in that summer season. It's a very, it's a very popular fishery. Uh, so Harry, if you might, don't mind me answering that real quick, I can. Sure. Yeah. So we looked at that. Uh, looked at last year's catch rate, and uh, based off that and number of fish caught, uh, that there's no additional days by going to one fish. And that, that's what I expected. I want to ask the question anyway. Uh, Warrior Rock to Bonneville, one of the options that you've listed is Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday. What's attractive to me there is it extends the, the closure date to the 18th. And maybe I'm parochial in terms of where I live, but the fishing doesn't really pick up, up say, Camas and above or even east of Vancouver until maybe the 9th or 10th of, of September. So at any later uh, opportunity is appreciated. And Appreciate some of the other comments about maybe some time in October because that that also can be a, an excellent fishery with with lower uh, tule impacts. Uh, lastly, on steelhead, I think we talked about it before. Uh, support the closure goes for Drano uh, from the point uh, east, uh, and uh, we can't you can't really enforce year, uh, I guess. Uh, but uh, those, those fish get hammered pretty hard in, 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 in catch and release. And I think moving the line out uh, would make a significant difference there. Thanks. Thank you, Harry. Appreciate that. Um, so next up, I have Greg King. Hey, Ryan. Hi, I have you. All right, Greg King. Uh, hey, thanks. Uh, another tough North of Falcon year. I want to thank uh, WDFW staff and ODF and W staff. You know, um, I'm going to speak to the 20,000 pound elephant in the room, and we're talking about impacts. And uh, John North has produced a study that started in 2012 and is up to 2021, and it shows the uh, impacts that guides are putting on um, our fisheries. And you heard the tribes speak of this earlier. Um, Wilbur spoke of this, and and, and in in 2018, we had uh, uh, 20 percent of the trips at Buiten. This is just for Buiten, and they took 30 percent of the take. Today, in 2021, they're doing 30 percent of the trips and 45 percent of the catch. So. This has been a huge elephant in the room, and I've mentioned it year after year, but it goes to deaf ear. And, and it is it is time that ODF and W step up to the Oregon Marine Board and either reduce these guides or put a quota on their fishery catches because the taxpayer and the sportsman are, are, are paying for these and they are making a cash cow, uh, Oregon Marine Board and the guides on, on these fisheries. And, and now I hear they want to take impacts from from the Callots fishery, the Longview fishery, and add them to buoy 10. This is just, it, it's gone off uh, on too, too long, guys. Uh, WDF and W, you, you, if you, and this is with all due respect, will you please stand up to Oregon and, 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 and go to your commission and say, something has to be done. 1,900 guides in Oregon there's only 124 charter licenses in Washington, and it's becoming a not only a, a uh, nightmare down there, uh, it's become a safety hazard too, with boating and uh, uh, 
all that goes with it. It's it's become uh, it's become more sportsmen don't want to go down there. They they just don't want to do that. So anyway, I I'm all for the uh, August first to the thirteenth um, and the twentieth through the fifth at Bowie Ten. Um, if, if that's what we got to do, that's what we got to do. Uh, I'm kind of with Harry Barber there. I'd like to see a one fish fishery for the, the Chinook and stretch that season out. And, and I'd also like to mention, um, the lower callets restrictions, lower, lower, lower callets, Lewis and, um, um, Kalama restrictions. It's not, it's not, uh, defining where those are at. I know for years it's been the, the Lexington Bridge on the Callets. Is it still that? Can you define that and, and or has it changed? I just want to know about that. So anyway, those are my comments today and I hope you take them uh, into consideration. Thank you guys. Thank you, Greg. Hey, Ryan, uh, if I could, just a, a clarifying question for, for staff, right? Under the Bowie 10 non-mark select option, that is not uh an and right it's not august 1 through 13 and august 20 to september 5th it is august 1 through 13 and or august 20 through september 5 right it's not and correct yeah it would be helpful if we included or in there uh, I'm sorry, Ryan and, and Tucker. Yes, I did kind of uh, uh, stretch that out. I see that. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that mispronunciation. Right, wanted to make sure that everybody knew that that was not a, a, a package. That was a, an or. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, all right. Hey, hey Ryan. Oh, go ahead, so Bryce. Bryce, I think I could answer one of Greg's questions really quickly here. So the the tributary steelhead regulation, the, the lower reach closures he's speaking to are the same as they have been, and, and those are listed in the tributary handout if he wants to take a look at them there. Thank you, Bryce. All right, thanks. All right, next up on the list, I have Randy Wosley. Go ahead, Randy. Thanks, Ryan. Um, well, a lot of information coming from questions asked by um, uh, anglers participating. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to comment on all this, but but obviously uh, staff has got an impossible mission uh, this year. Uh, kind of did last year as well as we moved in a similar sort of a season, you know, we changed the uh, mark selective dates this year, um, have a much broader mark selective season. Uh, we don't know yet what the harvest, what the, what the uh, um, non mark select season is going to be. Last year it shut down quite early. Uh, the power of the recreational fleet is obvious every year, and 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 then there's more demand every year. Uh, you know, to have successful fisheries, we need consistency. Uh, and I fear what we saw last year, we're going to potentially see again this year, where we've met our impacts early and had to shut down. Uh, and then, of course, looking up the river, ending dates, I mean, no fishing dates are earlier this year. The river will be closed uh, unless we see something. Well, I don't know what we could see to change that. We fish on forecast, so. Um, but it's it's uh, it's really tough. What I hoped we would see more this year, knowing kind of what was what we were going to be looking at as far as uh, alternatives is more of a sharing of the constraints. Uh, I had hoped that through North of Falcon, the managers would look at what uh, the ocean is doing, 
and and try and figure out a way to to share some of those Thule constraints. Um, not having coho fishing above uh, Warrior Rock, or ab excuse me, above yeah, above Warrior Rock this year, having the river completely closed is pretty frustrating for the recreational fishery. I think the fishery has proved that it can be successful if we have fishing opportunity. Uh, you know, in years gone by when there was more Chinook opportunity and summer steelhead opportunity and all those things, the fleet didn't focus on coho. But per last year, in, in other years where we had coho fishing opportunity, the fleet focused on it, proved that they could catch those fish. And we had a, a good uh, fishery in the upper river. Apparently not to be this year. So so those are frustrating things. It in in you know, I, I also kind of wanted to say something uh, based on some of the comments I heard earlier the the average angler out there that doesn't even really know what north of falcon is is really uh frustrated and and it's hard to explain to them why we're being so constrained in our fisheries uh, you know i don't know really what we can what we can do about that i also kind of wanted to to say that you know, and I'm I'm just a recre recreational angler. I'm not a, uh, a a guide, but I was in the industry for many years, and the the guide business is incredibly important to the overall uh, demand and participation in our fisheries in Oregon and Washington. Uh, you know, there are many, many people out there that want to participate and, uh, you know, don't have a boat. Uh, they have young kids coming up that they want to uh, expose to what Oregon and Washington has to offer in, in, in fishing opportunities. And, and the guides fulfill that service. They're incredibly important for that. So, uh, Uh, you know, I guess I guess that's really all all I have. It's uh, it's pretty frustrating that the river is going to be the up, the middle and upper part of the river is going to be shut down after the seventh or the fourteenth, depending on which part of it you're in. And uh, uh, you know, hopefully, with a ongoing coho fishery at Buoy Ten this year, we can uh, rally all the participants to focus on that and and continue to uh, have a, a viable if not really strong fishery on on coho this year thanks for the opportunity to address uh, some of the issues that i care about thanks bye thank you randy really appreciate that and thoughtful uh, statement you had there um, and definitely appreciate your input along the way um next up on the list i have liz hamilton i don't know if she's still on or not so um but liz if you are on you're up next if not we'll put you to the back of the list and, and keep moving forward all right i think she's uh come back later um so i'll, I'll move us on uh butch smith you're up next Thanks, thanks, Ryan, and and uh, once again, thank uh, both staffs uh, for for all their hard work. I I um, just uh, sympathize with with what's going on when we we don't have a full complement of fish we're able to get after, and we're under these constraints. It's not not easy, but I'll I'm going to speak for Buoy Ten, um, uh, president of the Owaco Charter Association. Um, but first, I you know need to recognize our co-manager friends what they said and and make sure their comments are taken and and uh that uh we make sure we 
fit our fisheries with theirs, not to uh, not to um, be be overrunning and and cause cause issues. We certainly we certainly don't want to do that, and uh, I want to make sure under our ever conservation minded commission that we make all our ESA goals and and uh, don't go over. So with those caveats, it's, it's always important at uh, buoy 10 that we uh, get the most days that we can down here in the estuary. Um, quality days as, as much as days on the water. I do I do want to kind of put up a placeholder if, if um, you know, we do, like Randy said, um, Wolsey uh, start catching Tulies at a higher rate than we predicted. You know, we we probably should have mechan some mechanism that we make sure we have enough coho to keep fishing at any point that we don't have to shut down the coho fishing too. If we if we uh, run over impacts in the river and have to don't have any for a, a coho only, um, that would be problematic. So um, I think those are those are the main things that I'm I'm looking at for this year's uh, buoy 10 and recognizing that what we see here right now could possibly change. We got, you know, more numbers coming out of Canada that appear not to be going in the right direction. So uh, there's a lot of shaping by a lot of fisheries on the West Coast this year to be still be done. So anyway, I want to thank you uh, and uh, John North and and the Oregon side for, for all your hard work. And I, I do... I do just want to put a caveat, I, you know, being in this long enough, you, uh, the buoy 10 line used to go to the bridge, Astoria Bridge, and then it went to Tongue Point, and now it's going up farther. I, I got to I gotta agree, that is, uh, that is kind of problem, some, you know, losing, losing some of the impacts. I know they're not, I know they're not designated for each area, but uh, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't help you know, when we keep moving, moving lines up because we're trying to, you know, take in a fisheries that's ever expanding, uh, um, you know, at some point in time, you know, that talk will have to be done, um, but not, not this year and I'm not proposing anything, but it is, it's coming. Um, so anyway, thank you again. And I will, uh, um, stand by the rest of the meeting. Have a great day. Thank you, Butch. Uh, appreciate your, comments there. Um, so circling back to the end of the list, uh, last hand that we uh, skipped over briefly was Liz Hamilton. Uh, Liz, it, it looks like you're on, so uh, it's your turn. And uh, you're muted. Hey, Liz, you are uh, muted. You are still muted. There you go. Sorry about that. I, and thank you for your patience. I, I appreciate it immensely. Um, I want to share some comments and, and remember that uh, not all of this comes directly from the industry. You know, we're selling your licenses over the counter, so we're sharing some of the comments we've heard from our customers as well. Um, we're, there, there was a concern about the, uh, the Thule in ER being at 38, but the model showing 38.8. And I think folks who cannot spend a week at PFMC are concerned that when, when that meeting is done, the extra uh, 0.8 comes out of the river, which is already suffering from some pretty constrained seasons. And so, um, you know, I, I realize you're going to do your best to take care of all the fisheries, but that's you know, we've got 0.8 to get down. Where's it coming from? Um, there, as we said last year, there's a concern about closing coho in the middle river when Chinook closes. And I don't know how you can get at that, but I think there's some recommendations about how that might happen later. Um, as someone mentioned earlier, the, the 360s have become a way to, to fish for coho in that area. And so it's hard to have everything closed when Chinook closes, especially as early as it does. Um, we remain concerned about the Tongue Point to West Puget Island section of the river being open this year for multiple reasons. Um, you know, when you add the impacts to buoy 10, buoy 10 
and even with all the sacrifices that are being made there, still has 4.26 of the Thule impacts while the other 100 miles of the river are sharing 2.74. So the public perception there is, is a bit problematic as far as the equitable sharing. Um, and it's a little bit of a head scratcher that, uh, you know, buoy 10 is waiting so long to go to full retention and still having that big of an impact on the on the Thule's. Um, I think people will be concerned that's not equitable. The other thing about closing that section of the river is we close sections of the river all the time. If you look sp at Spring Chinook, there's been all sorts of section closures of the river. So it's not an unusual thing to do in a year when you're really trying to dance on the head of the pin. Um, we think that closing it will help us learn whether or not that is a decent tool. Um, we also think that it will provide uh, more of a buffer to what could be some hot fishing again this year, especially the place that Cameron mentioned. Um, the area above uh, Warrior Rock is incredibly important to the retailers and the guides and, and the, co the community. And that if it closes on September 15th, that's just a gut punch to many of the retailers here in the region who um, rely on that section of the river. Um, the maybe one more question about the uh, Warrior to Bonneville uh, exploitation rate is the the 1.31. Is that divided between Bonneville Pool Hatchery and LRHs? And if so, you know, how, I, I mean, do we have a problem with Bonneville pool hatchery impacts? I just was curious about that, or we were. Um, one of the things that was discussed and maybe could be brought in as a package with closing the um, tongue point to West Puget Island might be to put a bubble at the cowlets we'd be interested in seeing what those two things together would create in terms of safety for all fisheries and a possible extension in the upriver where, again, someone pointed out there's really only about a week's worth of good fishing in the dates that are that are projected. Um, you know, there are tens of thousands of anglers that fish in this river and nearly 200,000 of them buy an extra permit to fish there. And when they look at the 60-40 sport commercial split, plus all the Chinook and Coho that are caught in the safe areas, again, perception, we talk a lot about perception. That's, that's a rough one. Um, and then finally, well, not finally, one, one other thing. Uh, Ryan, you you know you used to work in, in Puget Sound, did a great job there, doing a great job here. And I attend some of the Puget Sound meetings, and the folks in the meeting had a model to play with. So they had the numbers that we're aiming at, and they could check little boxes of different season management options and see how that changes the numbers. I would beg you to do that for us because we feel like we're you know throwing darts with blindfolds right now. Uh, we want to give you constructive input, but it's very difficult to to see a model have to have a meeting at eight o'clock at night to go over it. And so, again, all of us would be more constructive if we had that same sort of format that your agency provides for the Puget Sound fishery. It's a it's a it's a pretty I was impressed. It was a pretty awesome tool. Um, we do love the three coho bag at buoy 10 as soon as it's feasible. And we support opening the Summer Chinook on the 16th. And um, that's it. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. And if you have any questions, I'd uh, be happy to answer them. Thank you, Liz. Um, I might be able to handle a few things I've heard. And then I might, before we, uh, we're doing well on time, but before we uh, look for new hands and uh, additional thoughts and comments from others that haven't uh, spoken prioritize them first. I think I can address a few things I heard. Um, so far as at PFMC next week when it gets going, um, there's expectation it's a collective movement to get our, our LRH under 38. It's not any one party. And there's a lot of things in flux out there, uh, in and out, uh, to be honest. So uh, so just want to be, you know, recognize that part. Um, 
Farah, you know, definitely heard a continuation of considered coho post uh, Chinook closure um, above West Puget Island, um, you know, kind of pointed out, you know, mid have to get through about mid-October before the LRH are cleared. So there's just something we have to think about there of, of wind. But definitely I've heard that from quite a few folks. It's probably the most common input we've had so far. Um, and then far as the question about Bonneville pool hatchery, that is not part of the LRH piece that we're uh, managing to the 38%. So, um, so wherever you are in the river, it is a uh, lower river hatchery Thule is part of the 38%. Um, so Bonneville pool hatchery are not in a um, not part of that same exploitation rate. Um, and then I just want to, I think folks get this, but I, I just want to be absolutely clear that we haven't closed Tongue Point to West Puget Island. What we've done in the past in 2019 and 2020 is align the, Chin the Chinook regulations with Buoy 10. And that's what, in the table, that's what you're seeing. Um, so just, even though I'm hearing other things, I just want to be absolutely crystal clear on that one point um, for what that's worth. And so with that, um, before we uh, move on, I want to open it up to staff to any other questions you may have heard through public, through the commenting that we want to respond to. So kind of opening up to Tucker, Jimmy Q, Jeff, um, John, anyone else, any other staff. So just share, open it up to staff. Hey, uh, Ryan, this is Jimmy. Um, I had one quick comment about uh, the Callitz bubble uh, it's something that we tried to look at and, you know, we did a small bubble there in the spring and the idea was to try and do something like that and save some impacts or spread them around. Uh, but we d just didn't feel comfortable uh, with that concept. The flows in the fall are low and that callet's plume kind of moves around on the flood and the fish move with it. Uh, in addition, um, we think having two lines there would be uh, problematic for enforcement to try and deal with, uh, with one upstream line and one downstream line. And for that to achieve what we wanted it to or thought it would possibly do, we'd probably have to take a big area and close it, like from the Longview Bridge up to Prescott. And given how popular that area is, uh, we just didn't feel comfortable making that recommendation. Thank you, Jimmy. Hey, uh, this is Quentin too. I, I thought I heard Liz say a 60-40 on the commercial uh, sport. Um, with LRH being the limiting stock, uh, everything here is is more set to the you know 70 30 you know 70 30 sport 70 percent sport 30 commercial so with that it, yeah there we go thanks ryan um you could see how that's set there so i didn't quite i heard you say 60 40 i just wanted to clarify that that it's 70 30 on lrh no I, I i understand that i you know i also understand that we're not closing the area from tongue point to west puget island um, Ryan, no, the it's the total harvest of Chinook, and then adding in the safe areas. It's um, I don't know what the percentage is when you add in that, but anyway, that's I'm looking at the main stem Chinook harvest numbers on screen right now, not the not the LRHs. Yeah, uh, maybe you missed my point there, but um, with you know the impact that are accrued by the sport fishery. Um, you know, being kind of increasing over time here, um, it's kind of limiting their access to, um, I don't want to say freebies, but more of the surplus harvestable fish. So just kind of pointing that out, why that's sitting that way on the total mortalities, given the way that the sport fishery has been accruing the LRH impacts, but that's just a product of that. Thanks. Just trying to clarify. So, um, guess just going to look to Tucker, John, or I appreciate Jimmy jumping in there and Jeff. I know you kind of switched over a little later, but 
Um, anything you heard that you would like to respond to before I um, see if there's additional comments? Um, yeah, we just we wrapped up the commercial breakout about 10 minutes ago, so I've, I've just been on for the last last few minutes here of this conversation. I'm just listening at this point. Hey, Ryan, I just had one one more question. Uh, uh, yeah, let me. Uh, well, since we don't have any more staff questions, let me uh, create an additional speaking list since we have a half hour less, uh, left. So um, who is this? Sorry, I just want to make sure I get the everyone down, uh, right? Robert yeah I Robert thought so the talk, Robert the talker yeah the so Robert I have let me see who else uh wants to speak and then we'll come back through so I, I know so if there's folks who haven't spoken yet please and you want to please raise your hand or state your name and for those who have already provided testimony I'll probably put you at the back of the list and if there's time we'll come back to you um I know there's some lingering hands, so if lingering hands are still up, you're going to have to state your name so I get you on the list. Kyle Hawes. Kyle, I have you on the list. Thank you, Kyle. Hey, Ryan, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Phil, uh, Junior, I'll uh, wait my turn. All right, I have you on the list. Thanks. Thank you, sir. All right. Last call to get on the list. Okay. Oh, did I hear one more name? Jim Fowler. All right, Jim, I have you and I also see uh, Eileen's hand, so I have Eileen on the list as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to call that. Um, so, I'm Robert. I'm going to put you at the back just because others haven't spoken yet. But you are on the. You list. know what? Just hey, don't worry about it. Forget it. I'm done. Okay. Bye. All right. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Kyle Haas, why don't you go ahead? Kyle, are you still with us? And if so, you might be on mute. Are we there? Yes, you're here. Oh, good. I had to hit pound six a couple different times. Anyways, uh, we got a Thule stock, and um, you're going uh, Mark Select from the 17th to the 26th, massive low tides. And um, your Thule stock is marked, obviously. <clears throat> so everybody's going to pick your Thule stock out of everything because they're Mark Select and they want to take a fish home. So that's my question. Why are we doing Mark Select? Why don't we just do anything and everything we can? I'm good. Thanks, Kyle. Um, so I guess just uh, and feel free to jump in others uh but the, it's the the natural component of the lower river hatchery tule uh well kind of sounds like oxymoron but the, the the wild component of the lower river tule stock is the um wild listed stock that we're mm -hmm. trying to re exploitation rate right on i think that's the that's the simple way of thinking about it but yes for the lower river hatch hatchery tule program a very high proportion of the that stock are marked, so it is ha does have a high mark rate for um, lower river tules, just given the hatchery influence. Jeff, did I miss anything on that? Well, yeah, yeah, I think I, you know the basic concept there. Is, yes, we know LRH will be handled in that mark selective fishery, and many of them harvested because they are marked but the the like Ryan said the 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 management stock is the wild component so it's the effect of the to the unmarked piece so the difference between a mark select and mark select and non mark selective uh, fishery regulations are whether those unmarked fish are 
you know, bashed over the head and kept or whether they're released. Uh, so that's the difference. So it's those the wild, the, the unmarked component, including the wild stocks of interest will be released under the mark selective regulations that we're talking about. So the effect, you know, up to the to the exploitation rate will be lower than it would be under under a, a non mark selective scenario. So that that's why we, we use it. Thanks, Jeff, and uh, appreciate the question, Kyle. All right, so Bill Monroe Jr., you're up next. Hi, hey, Ryan, can you hear me? We can. All right. I didn't really want to say much. This is an obvious, difficult year again. This one seems a little bit more complicated than than others, though. This this Thule thing, and I guess what Brandy put down, and such they all kind of made the same sentiment. So you, we're going to do what we're going to do, and we're going to we're going to need to kind of make sure it runs to fruition without without having like a shutdown that is going to loom over our heads. That's that's really difficult. This isn't the uh, Anything else I want to dive into on fisheries, and this isn't exactly the meeting where we're going to start talking about a fishing guide versus a charter versus a sport recreational, but we are all fishermen that buy licenses to be able to participate in the opportunity to go fishing. Whether we make a living off of it or not, that's, that's one thing. But anyways, I just wanted to let you guys know that you've done a pretty, pretty I don't know how you do it with all this stuff going on. You threw in surgeon, you threw in, you know, a spring fishery, and now you, you're throwing in the really complicated fall fishery. And I just want to say thanks again. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Bill. We really appreciate that. Um, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, all right. So moving on, Eileen, you're up next. Hello, for the record, my name is Eileen Levy. I'm a rancher from Klickitat and Clark counties. I've spent my entire life on the Columbia. My family is fished from top to bottom, side to side for all the years, and I am now 74, so that's a fair period of time. In addition to which, of course, my parents did as well. What I remember most fondly are my trips, were my trips, excuse me, to Celilo Falls, which I will always miss, and I'm so sorry for all of you who are far too young to ever have experienced that. So that's a, that's a misfortune. I think what I wanna start and stop with today is in my opinion, the misnomer that recreational fishing is anything other than commercial fishing. Except for the individuals who take their kids and go down to the banks of the river and throw their line out, all the rest of it, in my opinion, is commercial. Now that's not to suggest that I don't think the tribes are in their own respect commercial as well, but they have a treaty that they are asking us to abide by and I certainly think that we need to do that. I also wanna say in very strongest terms I can that I think the Washington and Oregon fish and wildlife folks need to be canonized to try to make sense of this and to keep all of the warring factions at bay. But most importantly, I think it's important important for there to be a union representative for the fish who have absolutely no say in any of this. And the only part is that they're the most popular individual or entity in the room in that everybody wants to catch them. So let me close by saying I adamantly and absolutely oppose any catch and release to suggest that any critter is not going to be able to uh, is going to be able to survive that, depending upon how long it takes them to get into the boat, is uh, anybody's guess. And I suspect very strongly that the very far majority of them do not survive. So I will close with that. Thank you for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. I very much appreciate it. Thank you, Eileen. Appreciate your, your comment today and joining us. Uh, next up, I have Jim Fowler. Uh, can you hear me, guys? Yes, we can. 
Uh, I've heard kind of off and on most of this, and I think, uh, man, everyone's got ideas and plans, and everyone's, everyone's, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know how to make sense of it, I guess. Um, I applaud you guys for trying to figure this out. I, I think, uh, man, how do we get more resource? I think that's the big thing here is we're all trying to figure out where we can shave a little off here or there for ourselves or whatnot. Um, I'm just going to hope that more fish come back than you guys think. And, uh, Hopefully we have a really good year. It's looking good. Uh, thanks for everything, guys. I look forward to a big season. Thank you, Jim. I think we all do. Hope for more to come back than what we can forecast. All right, that was the end of my speaking list. So just thinking out loud, I mean, some common themes I heard, I'm gonna run through my list um, and let other staff at, fill in the blanks, but. I think the most, you know, we heard some support for Bowie 10 Mark Selective. Um, I think the most common theme that came up was consider something above West Puget Island for coho, whatever that might look like. Um, kind of, you know, make sure there's some opportunity there. Um, I think it depends on the start date, may come at some cost. It's an uh, LRH impact, so that's just depends on the date there. I um, heard. June 16th start for Summer Mark Select. Um, three fish bag at buoy 10 or, you know, post Chinook retention makes sense to protect the buoy 10 coho fishery. Um, heard a comment or two on the consideration of a days per week for lower, for Warrior to Bonneville, but, um, and also for uh, multiple supports for you know, largely what's on the table. And then uh, I guess the other element is a uh, question around Tongue Point to Puget Island, um, what more to do or where those impacts come from. I think that is a very probably high level set of comments I thought I heard. I'm sure I missed a couple in there. So just look into Tucker or Jeff or, or others uh, if I missed anything else. No, I mean, I think you covered a lot of this stuff, Ryan. I mean, I think we, we heard some general concern, you know, from both, you know, lower river and upper river interests on how, uh, you know, those LRH impacts are being distributed between fisheries and, and you know, and how we are you know, allocating out those LRH impacts and how, you know, how we are using the river area and whether or not we need to consider closing areas to, to optimize opportunity. And, you know, and I think, you know, personally, I'm sensitive to that. I think we need to be creative to, you know, optimize opportunity here and there. Um, you know, I think, you know, another Thing we heard, you know, not just today and, and not even just this year. And, and frankly, I'm not sure how we accomplished this given the resources we have uh, available to us is, you know, more uh, you know, trying to figure out a, a, a more interactive system, you know, uh, to engage people, right? I, I've seen a few comments and heard a few comments about that. I mean, I think in an ideal world, uh, I mean, Frankly, that seems uh, inconceivable that you could do that in the Puget Sound with a, a plug and play click system. Um, that seems unbelievable to me, like a fairy tale. I don't know how you have uh, that kind of system. I would love to have those sort of resources here uh, to do that. Um, I, you know, that would be amazing. Um, I don't, I can't imagine having those resources available. If we had, I think that would be fantastic. You know, I'd love to be able to develop those sorts of tools uh, to have that stuff available here. Um, something to look forward and work towards uh, maybe in the future, but certainly not anything we have available at this time. 
So uh, I really appreciate everybody's interest uh, and time and engagement. Uh, you know, the things we do and work towards and come up with are better uh, for the engagement and insights uh, and thoughts and questions and probing that people uh, put forward. And so all of that is very much appreciated. Um, you know, this doesn't work in a vacuum. So I really appreciate everyone's efforts today and through this whole process. Uh, and it will continue um, through the rest of the PFMC process. So thank you. Yeah, I, I echo everything Tucker said. Again, I wish we had the resources Puget Sound has um, because I, I know how much it takes to open, the, you know, open and manage those fisheries. And it takes a lot here in the Columbia River, too. And we do a very good job. Um, I think we really thought long and hard and worked nonstop from our first North of Falcon meeting, which, you know, we wish we could have provided more information on the front end, but uh, we were kind of hamstrung a little bit there. But we worked long and hard to get to today. Um, and yes, we know it's not perfect. It's a, it's far from what everyone wants to have. Um, and, you know, but it's, I think from my perspective, what I heard today was some considerations and maybe, you know, kind of what's in the, the table for most of the fisheries. I think it largely checks a lot of those uh, key elements to, you know, protect the fisheries in season. Uh, I think that's a thing we strive for. It's not going to guarantee anything, but we can do a very good job of, uh, of tracking those catch inputs and, and, and in season updates as we have those. Um, so I really, really do appreciate everyone's time and, you know, not just today, all the past years and, and months and blood, sweat and tear uh, to get us where we are today. Everyone stepped up. And so I think expect we all will in the future, too. But uh, really appreciate it. I thought today's meeting went really well. So I want to thank everyone for all the thoughts and comments they had. I really I think it really does help us. So with that, I'll look to Jeff or any other staff for any other concluding statements. Yeah, I'll just I'll echo your points there, Ryan. Appreciate everybody's input. I'll uh, I'll circle up with uh, with folks on, on my side and you, Ryan, after the fact here and catch up on what I missed. Um, sounds like I missed a, a good discussion, or at least a good chunk of it. So. I uh, will catch up with you guys, but yeah, I appreciate everybody's participation today and the feedback you've given. Um, that's going to help us as we continue to move forward here. Kyle Haas got a has a comment. I think we were close, Kyle. Um, but um, I will use my gavel uh, and and uh, give you this one exception if you keep it real brief. Can you still hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Excellent. I hit. I didn't know what I hit and when I hit it. But anyways, um, thank you for everybody for uh, helping and assisting. And I do know that it is a long, arduous process to do all this. But um, it, you have a hard situation to compromise between what? 300 miles of river to establish between one asphyxiation to the other, between guides, between commercial, between everything else. You have to figure it out. Thank you for your hard effort in doing this. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Brian, I see that uh, Jeremy from NOAA has his hand up. Yeah, go for it, Jeremy. No, I just wanted to uh, say thanks to you as well for you guys running a real uh, tight ship today and uh, appreciate the hard work. Look forward to working with you guys as we move through next week. Definitely. We'll see you soon. All right. Uh, I think with that, um, I think we're going to call it a wrap for this public meeting. 
Um, we do have those preseason uh, plans that we will, the states will develop and distribute when we're ready. Um, ob obviously, you can um, reach out to staff uh, where things are headed, but uh, we'll, we're going to be pretty busy uh, come next week. We've got a lot going on, so just bear with us if you don't get a really timely response. We've got spring Chinook fisheries wrap around the corner and setting fall and summer f fisheries. So uh, a lot on our plates, but uh, thanks everyone for your input and you all have a wonderful day. Continue to stay safe and maybe next time we'll be in the same room together. <laughs>